I think um, that good pot, it has to kind of reveal something about the maker. What you find in it is actually not so different um, from what you would hope to find in another person. Um, you would hope to find sort of life and uh, a kind of response, a sort of brightness. Um, I think it's important that you would want to touch it, to hold it. I used to think that there had to be evidence of, um, of good craftsmanship. I'm not sure about that anymore. In fact, I don't think it really matters. I think that craftsmanship um, is, is, is simply the tool which has enabled you to express yourself. So that, um, I think, I'm, I'm misquoting, but Hamada, uh, I think he uh, said something like he spent the first half of his life learning how to, and the second half forgetting. Uh, in other words, your technique it's only there to help you. In itself, it's nothing. It can actually hinder you. In Michael Cardew, um, I found the perfect teacher. Um, he didn't teach in the, uh, in the conventional sense. In fact, he was quite difficult to approach directly. Like, for example, if he was throwing, he hated people watching him. I think because at one time he'd been quite an athletic thrower, but in his, he was already 69 when I got there, and I think that a lot of his strength had gone. And so he, he was kind of a bit ashamed of what he was making. And he had a very, very, very quick temper, and, and he would shout, something I was totally unused to. I, I certainly wasn't going to you know, have confrontations with him every day. That, that wasn't why I was there. I was there to learn. And I didn't really do an apprenticeship. I, I, I just kind of, um, um, I just kept a low profile and just got on with it, that's all. I basically taught myself. But I taught myself in a very, very good environment. But I was totally, totally motivated when I went there. And um, I think those three and a half years that I spent there, they actually have provided me with, um, with the momentum that's kept me going ever since. One of the things that we lack in the West in terms of tradition and pottery is, um, in Britain anyway, there's no real tradition for a specific pot, for a specific food. So in Japan, everyone understands that this pot is used for that food. You drink this out of that. Uh, you cook this in that. We don't have that, and that's a real shame because actually food and this kind of pottery, they're intimately linked. The people that you show in your gallery are all very heavily influenced by tradition, but none of us is a traditional potter. None of us was taught by a traditional potter. Well, I, Clive and I were slightly because we, we both worked at Branham's Pottery whilst there were still two old blokes there, but. We kind of dip into tradition. Um, we use the techniques of tradition. It has kind of almost religious status. Uh, but in fact, it's also something that can, can stifle you. So for example, uh, there's a few of us in Britain who fire in a so-called anagama, you know, Japanese kind of way, very protracted firings. I think in Japan, they would have a tough time recognizing what we're doing. Um, and I think the difference is that in Japan, a lot of the potters that I've come across, incredibly skillful, but they work in a, uh, the people who work in the wood fire tradition, they have specific traditions to which they go. So they're gonna work in a shigaraki kind of mode or uh, in an iga kind of mode. There, there seem to be very strict parameters beyond which they don't stray. Uh, and we put combinations together which probably wouldn't be allowed in Japan. The customers wouldn't understand it. Um, I'm not sure that our customers understand, but there is a kind of a freedom from, from being totally hidebound by tradition. Like a lot of people who um, trained in the 60s and 70s, you know, it was like 
slightly puritanical time. You know, it was going back to being pure. Um, so uh, when I started out, I'd been to the Far East, and uh, what impressed me was the scale at which everything was done. And away from places like Mashiko, there was a kind of total lack of pretension, whereas in the West, there already was. So when I came back from the Far East, um, I'd already, I already knew I wanted to, to work on a big scale. That simply confirmed it for me. So um, I built a very big kiln. It was 600 cubic feet. And my idea was to make lots and lots of pots, thousands of pots, and to sell them as cheaply as I could um, and so that people would buy them and, and use them. That was the important part. They would use them. They, they, wouldn't kind of, they wouldn't put them on a shelf. It would be cheap enough for them to use them, break them, and come and replace them. And um, that was a very idealistic um, um, uh, thing for me to do. But I mean, it, it suited my temperament. I, I certainly, I would have described myself first and foremost as a thrower. I think probably making big pots is my favorite form of throwing. Um, I think. I started making big pots really early in, in, in my career, and Michael Cardew, he encouraged that. He was actually incredibly generous to me. There is no way that I'd allow someone, unless I had a big gaping hole somewhere in my kiln, to put a big, badly made pot. I, 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 quite often the feedback I get is, is that um, when I'm doing big pots, that this is some kind of macho activity you know, uh, that I, I indulge in. You couldn't be more wrong. Uh, it's the complete opposite. It's actually, it's a process that I've been through thousands of times. Uh, I kind of, um, um, it's a sort of repetition. It's uh, like a mantra. It's, it's like, uh, for me, it's like meditation. I haven't made as many big pots as I used to. It used to be about 80% of what I did was just making big pots. And I could sell them, there was no problem. Now it's more difficult, uh, especially because I want real money for them now because I suddenly realize there's no one else doing it. And actually, my time is pretty is coming to an end. I don't mean my life, but I hope not. But I mean, you know, the, 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 um, the, you know just having the strength uh, to do it. The glazing, yeah, that actually has become quite important to me. Um, it never used to be. Uh, everything was unglazed. Um, but, you know, this is just where we're Do I enjoy it? Um, not really. All my glazes are slightly caustic and... Uh, you know, your hands and skin get really, really dry. But the, the, what's really nice about my job is that it's, it's got lots of aspects to it, uh, some which calm me right down, others which get me going. If you're going to fire with wood, it's a very, very time-consuming, very, very expensive way of doing it, and the losses are enormous. Um, I've, I've had firings where I've lost 80% of the, of the pots. I've looked in... Sometimes it's been something, a mistake that I made in the last five minutes of the firing, and, I, and I've just destroyed everything. I, I think now I kind of approach firings like a whipped dog, tail between my legs, ears back, whimpering sideways. And, and uh, you know, so, uh, um, uh, you know, experience has taught me to be afraid. If you're going to fire with wood, you may as well actually take full advantage of what's happening. And one of the things that's happening is that throughout the firing, Ash is being deposited on the pots. That ash, uh, at high temperature by itself, will melt and make a, um, a glaze. It's not exactly random, because when you have experience, then you begin to place pots in such a place where you kind of expect something is going to happen. You, you begin to understand different parts of a kiln and so on. So not only is ash landing on the pots, but if you're firing in this anagama style, you're actually side stoking in over the pots, uh, so that the pots are actually covered in embers. So then another thing's happening. There's very, very intense changes in atmosphere. And uh, so one side of the pot might be slightly oxidized and you'll get some rather bland colors. The other side will be in such intense reduction, maybe for up to five days, that it'll be completely different. So it'll be a little bit like, like the moon. You see like the, the bright side and then you can just make out that there's a dark side. And often the pots have that. And I, I take advantage of that. So in my kiln, I tend to pack it symmetrically so that I have two pots, one either side, one up against the wall uh, and that side, one up against the wall and that side. And you get like two different sides. 
on this one, if you look at it from the front, there's a pale side and a dark side. The dark side was the bit facing towards the, 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 the middle of the kiln where there's um, a lot of embers piling up against the pot. This side, which is slightly oxidized, is away from it. And uh, I, that's, I really kind of love that. And you can see, uh, then you can also see the work of the ash. There's ash and embers have been accumulating on, on the top of the pot. It's lying on its side. And at high temperature, it melts and comes around the pot and kind of joins up kind of here in the, in the, in, in, in the middle. I don't think in Japan, I'm, I'm not sure, I don't think they would kind of like this very much. Uh, this, this, this is not how you treat chinos. Something else that I noticed in the firing was I, I have a celadon glaze. It's a really basic celadon glaze. Um, it tends to be, I am actually colorblind, so to be careful, but it's a, 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 I, I perceive it as being a kind of uh, a bluey, greeny gray. Uh, it's a coal. When it's fired correctly um, uh, and it's thick, it's actually quite a cool glaze. And um, I like that, the combination of that uh, with the, the red of the body. So like hot body, cool glaze. Um, and then I notice that um, on some of the pots, uh, the liner glazes, which I use this for, uh, when it was exposed to ash, um, actually something very beautiful happened. It, it went from being um, 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 uh, just a straight celadon to being a, a kind of um, chun, which is a, um, an optical blue. Uh, but it was an exciting chun, because there were, although there was blue, the, I think I can also see um, a, a yellow and green in it. And um, so then I began to, to, um, to rather than just use uh, shinos, uh, uh, to, to then actually glaze these pots in, in, um, uh, in a celadon and then put them in the areas where they had maximum uh, contact with ash and embers. And uh, so this would be an example. Get rid of that one. This is the celadon, and that's the color of the celadon. I don't know if you can see that. But then it's been lying on its side on shelves. And this is the side facing in towards the firebox. And on top, you can see it's kind of blue. And then where it's kind of accumulated, there's all sorts of different things ha happening. And I also, I'm not sure what color that is, but it looks kind of sugary, sort of off-white. But um, uh, I think it's, it, it kind of gives life to the, to the pot. Uh, but I do have a favorite pot, and it's not mine. They come from Burma, or from Southeast Asia, and they were exported through a Burmese town called Martaban. And uh, they're big, black storage jars. It's a pot that kind of, it grabs your attention. You can't, you can't ignore it. It's, it's very, very quiet. It doesn't shout. Uh, very, very, very strong. It's not macho. In fact, it's quite feminine. And um, I was thinking about it the other day, and it's a sort of pot that I'd like to kind of lie down in its shadow and go to sleep. Uh, it's, it, it has that kind of, it's just, um, um, it just has this incredible presence. If I was just throwing, I would be bored out of my skull. I actually like stacking wood, and people laugh at it, but, um, you know, he who laughs last, laughs longest, because I go to help other people with firings, their wood's all over the place. They're still cutting wood during the firing and they wonder why it's so stressful. My wood, it's all there, and it's, uh, it's been there, so it's dry, and it's in place. Everything is kind of sorted into different sizes, so what you need, you just go to the right place. Uh, you don't have to struggle. And I usually have two people come and help me, and, uh, and then we do four hours on, eight hours off, and there's only one person at the kiln at a time, and I'm not that keen on, on people coming to watch. Inevitably, what happens is that they um, track up a conversation with, it, with whoever is, is firing, and you then you stop thinking about the kiln and you start thinking about the answer. I don't want to sound like get really kind of heavy about the kiln, but you do have to concentrate. And even when you're kind of um, when it seems that you're doing the same thing again and again and again for hours and hours, and you there are so many things that you can miss 
And if you're firing for five days and you use all that wood and you've missed something and you get a boring firing, I mean, what was that all about? That's a complete waste. Throw it all away. All that work and wood and stuff down the drain. So you have to think. So I, I sometimes get quite shirty with people who, who come back. The other thing I can't bear during firings is and it's men who do it. And uh, men have this idea that, um, that uh, fire and men, I mean, it goes together. It's obvious. It's like barbecues. You know, the fact that they in, inevitably or invariably, you know, burn the meat, <laughs> that's beside the point. That's good. You know, charcoal. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's not good in the kiln. And, and you'll be surprised how many of them want to break a record. They want to get there really quickly. And, uh, and also, you know, when they're stoking, they're knocking pots left, right and centre and they don't give a shit. <laughs> if you're not careful, um, your, your family life can suffer. And I was sort of lucky. I mean, my family life did suffer. I mean, I ended up divorced. Um, um, but what was nice about it was that, that this kind of work was that um, uh, I work from home. So um, um, I saw my kids a lot. Even though I was working hard, um, they, they kind of they knew where I was and they would come out and talk to me and they could see what I did for a living and they understood all about that. Um, uh, but I did work very, very long hours. And... Um, and I felt that I had to because I was the sole breadwinner. Well, it's definitely changing pottery. I mean, I think that actually that this, the pots that your gallery seem to be interested in, um, uh, I think we're kind of sort of dinosaurs, really. We're, we're kind of heading for extinction because simply that, that, that interest in that horrible word tradition isn't being reinforced. And lots of people come out of college, they can't even throw. Um, they can design something and then they, they can get a little man to do it. Uh, I think that's, that's the way it's going. And, and so that whole slightly idealistic uh, approach of the functional potters of the 60s and 70s, I, th I think that, that'll go with us. Um, uh, it, it'll, it'll just be different. I mean, our generation was different to the people who taught us. I make... Uh, sort of jars that come from from the sort of things that I love, that which I've seen all over the world, and uh, which had a function once. But I know for a fact that their only function now, I hope that that, that this still this function still exists, is that um, that they kind of that they bring people some kind of. Um, um, happiness, some sort of consolation, that these are um, items that they can, um, you know, hold and, uh, uh, in their hands. And, and uh, I think that a lot of um, oil or gas or electric-fired pots, they can be spectacular, but actually they tell their entire story first time you see them. There is what you see is what you get. There is no hidden message there. With a wood-fired pot, especially ones that come from these very uh, protracted firings. Whichever side you look at it, it's different. There's so much going on. Uh, you can look at the pot, you can turn it around slightly, it's a different pot. And so it, it, um, it releases its story to you very, very slowly. And I hope that it's money well spent. I hope that the function is that they bring some kind of consolation. Mm -hmm.